200 days is the length of time it's gonna take us to get to Mars. So if we're not thinking that we better figure out what happens to a human in an isolated, confined, extreme environment before we go 200 days to Mars, we're not thinking at all. All these hallmarks of aging, if we can just start clipping it and trimming it back and making it better, you give yourself the better opportunity to survive. If you're doing that, that means you're multiplying your life of yourself by one third. Welcome to the Seam Lund Podcast. I'm your host, Seam Lund, and our guest today is Dr. Joseph Duturi. Joseph broke the world record for spending 100 days in an underwater port. He's got a PhD in biomedical engineering, and he's a researcher of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. In this episode, we're going to talk about Joseph's trip underwater and how it increased his telomere length by 20%. We'll also talk about the proposed health benefits of hyperbaric medicine. Joseph, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm uh, excited to have you on the show. And uh, you recently became quite popular on uh, media for having broken the world record for spending the most days under sea. So it's a really you know, fascinating experiment that you did. And uh, there's also like a lot of interesting science behind that experiment. So I'm yeah, really excited to uh, talk with you today. Oh yeah, hundred percent. We had a uh, we had a good time doing it, and we did science. So we tried to make science cool. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, well, I guess we can begin by maybe you can give an overview of you know many people might not have heard about the experiment. So what did you do, and what was like the significant thing about it? So as you know, I have a PhD in biomedical engineering. So I'm a clinical researcher sort of a guy. And what we wanted to do was figure out what happens to a human being when you leave it in an isolated, confined, extreme environment for a long period of time. We chose underwater. There are many reasons why, but we'll get into those later. But what I wanted to do was that biomedical research sort of stuff. So while I was down there for 100 days, we said, hey, listen, we're going to check blood, saliva, urine, uh, electrocardiograms, electroencephalograms, pulmonary function tests to the scale that hasn't been done since since C lab days. So that's the kind of level of research that we wanted to do. You, what happens to a human when you leave them there, right? So we wanted to figure that out. Why 100 days? Well, 100 days was just a mark, and everybody's like, "Well, you know, you just wanted to break the world record." I said, "No, I I really shorted myself by 100 days because I wanted to stay for 200 days. 200 days is the length of time it's going to take us to get to Mars." So if we're not thinking that we better figure out what happens to a human in an isolated, confined, extreme environment before we go 200 days to Mars, we're not thinking at all, right? So mm. that's what I wanted to do by and large. But I just we I couldn't afford to stay 200 days, to be honest right. with you, because uh, we paid out of the International Bank of Joe and some graciousness of a, a nonprofit corp. But uh, and the second thing we wanted to do is we want to take kids and show them that science can be cool. Not that I'm cool per se, but that you can do science in cool environments. It's not all about beakers and, you know, white lab coats and microscopes and oh, boring, right? So if you get out in the wild and do research in the environment, it can be better. And the third reason and final reason is we wanted to talk to everybody in the underwater realm from astronauts to aquanauts to marine scientists to microbiologists to sponge doctors for crying out loud and find out what makes them tick and why they want to take care of the marine environment and why it's so important to us and protect, preserve, and now rejuvenate our marine environment. So those are the three main things that we did while we were down there. and We had a whole lot of fun. So. <laughs> yeah. Must have been a fun, like a hundred, you were alone there, right? For a hundred days. By and large, I was alone. People came to visit, but by and large. I was okay. Gotcha. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. So you would say that being underwater like mimics some of the same environment as you would like travel to Mars in space or what? hundred percent, a hundred percent, right? You know, you have to worry about a lot of things. You have to worry about your air source, same thing. So mm -hmm. a lot of these things, you know, they're very similar environments. Uh, so analogous is the word that we use. It's an analog for space travel. So absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, it's obviously uh, going to be a long, long time away until we actually get to Mars. And uh, oh, yeah. it obviously makes sense to kind of test similar environments because, you know, you know, there's, it's such a, like, uh, I guess, such a massive feat to be able to travel in space such a long time. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't even like know the problems necessarily, what we might face and we need to kind of. Right. Come. 
come into conclusion of what are the possible like uh, problems. 100%. I mean, I love Elon. He wants to go to Mars and it's great, but we got <laughs> some serious problems and we need some serious people to start doing research into it before we get on the plane. Like, who's going to carry us off the plane when we get to Mars? Like, mm. <laughs> like how do we maintain the muscle? How do we build the bone? What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink for crying out loud? You know, there's, there's like real problems, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, but what about like living under water in general? Like, would would it be feasible or would it be any like anything rational behind living underwater as a species in general like if uh, the earth like the land becomes messed up or something <laughs> oh absolutely it's protective from ionizing radiation number one uh as long as we don't just roll up in there and treat the water like we've treated our earth so mm -hmm. let's not do that right? <laughs> let's, let's try and get it a little bit better. I mean, I, I always tell people, I say, let's, this is the big blue globe on which we live, right? We've got to take care of this thing because this is what we got. This is it, right? And most yeah. of it's water, but boy, if we don't start taking better care of it, we're going to be in trouble. Mm. So what was the like port like, uh, I think, uh, some people might have done scuba diving. I don't think many people have like spent long times underneath the sea. So uh, what was like the living conditions like for you? And like, how, how deep did you actually go? So I was in a habitat and this habitat is basically a pressurized cylinder, very much akin to this, this cup. So it's pressurized. It has a hole in the bottom and it's pressurized so much so that the air is bubbling out the bottom, but it's underwater. And while it's underwater, I could be a little dry. Little dry, I say, because it's a hundred percent human environment. So it's really not that. Uh, so you know, you you you're down there for a long period of time. You're moist. Your cuts don't heal very well. Things like that. Mm. So there are some cons for living underwater. But um, while you're down there, you get to rinse off with fresh water. You get to dry off with towels, and hopefully, you have a great support crew, which I did, that supported me in my endeavor. I mean, and you know, like I said, we did blood, urine, saliva, electrocardiograms, all the testing. I did about uh, seven, eight hours of science a day, every day. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. <laughs> uh, you, I think you um, mentioned in some of the interviews that, uh, you know, you lost weight, your blood markers improved, and you also, oh, yeah. like, telomere length increased and stem cell um, amount increased as well. So, like, um, yeah, like, can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So every single inflammatory marker in my body was cut in half, but that's a known mechanism of action of hyperbaric medicine. Hyper mm. means more than baric means pressure, right? So hyperbaric medicine has been around for 400 years. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this, because I also do research in hyperbaric medicine. So we wanted to make everybody understand the mechanism of action. So we knew we were going to get decreased inflammatory markers, you know, all during COVID, we were treating people in hyperbaric chambers with great efficacy because it was an inflammatory process, right? So if we can quell that systemic inflammatory response, we can do great things. But, you know, uh, I... I basically decreased my cortisol by, you know, from double digits to single digits. And with a decrease in cortisol, you have a corresponding increase in testosterone, which that remained around for a little while, which was epic, right? I mean, so, you know, I'm, I'm 57 years old, epigenetically, I'm registered as 34, right? And that, that is part of the way that I live, right? I live in the gym. I go to the gym. I go work out. I take care of myself. I eat the right way. So part of that is just me, but part of it is the fact that I did live underwater and that it does things like give you more stem cells, uh, give you collagen synthesis, right? All those kind of things are things that you need. And collagen just isn't the stuff that you inject in your face, right? Like, you know, mm. women put collagen in their face. It's not just that. It's the building block of every cell in your body. So if you synthesize collagen production, holy mackerel, you can now build more cells in your body to replace the ones that are broken or senescent or whatever. Mm. So yeah, lots of really good things came of it. I want to take a quick break to talk to you about my favorite collagen out there. Collagen peptides have been shown to reverse skin aging in several human clinical trials. They do so because of being much more bioavailable than regular whole food collagen sources. Collagen content in your skin starts decreasing in your 20s already, at a rate of about 10% per decade. So you should start using collagen already in your 20s, and the sooner you do, the better it is for your skin aging. 
the brand of collagen I'm using, Nordcode, has the optimal type of collagen peptides in the low molecular weight form. They've also added 5 grams of extraglycine, which is an amino acid responsible for collagen synthesis as well as glutathione synthesis, the powerful antioxidant in the body. The Nordcode Complete Collagen also has vitamin C, which initiates collagen synthesis and eggshell membrane, which has been shown to support joint function. The collagen is sourced from grass-fed cows from the Alps, so it's one of the highest quality collagens in the world. Head over to livehealthy.com forward slash collections forward slash Nordcode to get a 10% discount with the code SEAM10. All right, back to the video. Uh, I think a lot of people, at least me included, my first like thought was like, uh, so the reason you saw those improvements because of being in uh, like this environment that is out of your habitual environment and you like end up eating less calories and uh, you lose weight and you're like, not exposed to air pollution and those kind of things. Like, So how, how much of a role do you think uh, those things are played in your like improvements in biomarkers and uh, and other things. So we're scientists, right? So basically, I'm a creature of habit. I do the same thing every day. I wake up in the morning and I eat four eggs, a little bit of cheese, and a little bit, three or four eggs, a little bit of cheese, and a little bit of meat. It might be bacon. It might be you know pan. It might be something sausage, whatever. But that's my mixture in the morning. I ate that this morning. I ate it yesterday morning. I eat it every morning. All right. Same thing. Lunch is a handful of nuts, uh, a bunch of protein, and a salad. Dinner is some protein and something green. That's it. I, I just, <laughs> I'm not a very complicated person, right? So everybody's like, oh, you're just dieting right now. And they're like, no, I was not dieting. <laughs> Hyperbaric oxygen increases your metabolism. So if it increases your metabolism, it's obviously going to decrease your weight, right? It, it's fact. This it's, it happens, right? So while I'm down there, I just didn't know that it was going to happen this much. So I lost uh, 15 pounds in 25 days. Mm. And I was like, okay, so much so that my medical staff, a bunch of doctors that I trained that were on my team, they said, listen, you've got to double your protein. So I wound up eating 1.7 times, 1.75 times the amount of protein that I usually eat on the surface. So usually, you know, I'm, I'm 100 kilos. So usually I'll eat, uh, you know, a hundred grams of protein. Uh, so I had to eat 175 grams of protein every day just to maintain weight, right? Mm. So, Cause I didn't want to lose any more weight. I don't, I don't like being right. thin. Like, you know, I'm fit. I don't like being thin. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah. Like I would, you know, you, you would think that, yeah, you're eating less, which, you know, might happen to a subconscious degree, but you're also like moving less because how, how big is the port? Like you're not able to like go for walks there. Right. Yeah. You're definitely not able to do any aerobic activity. However, I went out and I swam for about an hour every day. I went out and I okay. kicked around and scuba dive because uh, I was underwater. I may as well go scuba dive. Uh, now you are a little colder while you're under there. So that mm. increases your metabolism, obviously. So there's something to that. But is it a is it a thing? No, it's not. That's the the attribution is the increase in metabolism. I mean, anybody can talk, but I actually did it. So yeah, everybody's like, "Oh, you didn't eat," and I mean, like to the point of, I, I don't eat this way normally. But once a week, I allowed them to bring me down a chocolate covered key lime pie on a stick. Mm. I never eat that kind of crap, right? <laughs> but. I ate it once a week while I was there because if you're in Key Largo, you may as well eat Key Lime Pie on a stick, right? right? But, you know, I mean, I never eat sugar. I never eat. It's just not my jam. But once a week, I did that. Why? I, it was a thing. It was mm. goofy. So I did it. But, uh, you know, it wasn't like, uh, you know, I led a sedentary lifestyle while I was down there. I was always running from the microscope to, to but, uh, you know, even though we just did seven to eight hours of science a day, then we did about three hours of teaching. I lectured to 5,575 kids in, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and those were like literally three hour lectures, three hours of lectures every day. And I also taught biomedical engineering while I was down there at the University of South Florida. And then I did like two hours of interviews per night. I think I did 150 interviews in the entire time I was down there, which is wow. crazy, <laughs> crazy, the amount of interviews. So yeah. I was a one-armed paper hanger. I mean, I would work from dawn to dusk, you know, 
So I drank the exact same thing that I drank, which is nothing but water. This is water. I know it looks like coffee. It's literally water. Uh, I drink about a gallon of water a day. I still drank about a gallon of water a day and two cups of coffee. That's it. Mm. Right. Wow. So yeah, that's that's very interesting. Yeah, like I didn't know about the the kind of a cheat meal there, <laughs> which uh, you know makes it more kind of I guess uh, believable that it there was some like additional effect on your metabolism. Uh, somehow. Oh, yeah. Or it could be. I mean, uh, you know, everyone knows the Michael Phelps who uh, ate like twelve thousand calories a day because he was swimming like many hours <laughs> every day, and the cold might yeah, also, the like, water affect... whisks heat away from your body. What twenty five times faster or something? It's ridiculous. Twenty five percent faster, whatever. The point being that, yes, you do get a little colder while you're down there. And I was cleaning the habitat, working and, you know, mm -hmm. taking care of myself. But, but you know, I take care of myself every day. And, you know, yeah. so, yeah, I wouldn't have imagined that I would have lost weight. I would have imagined that I would have gained weight being sedentary, being more sedentary than I normally am. Usually I'm in the gym. But one of the things that we wanted to prove was this blood flow restriction cup. So all I did was this elastic band and a blood flow restriction device. And I hmm. worked out with that. And okay. that was it to see if I could maintain muscle mass the entire time I'm down there. Like when we go to space, right? We're going to be on that spaceship. We got to figure out how to freaking maintain muscle mass. So, hmm. right. So you use the blood flow restriction training. Like I, I, I'm a pretty big fan of those as well. Like you're just able to oh. like stim stimulate the muscle with light, lighter weights and uh, with less loads. 100 percent. i love them i really had a good time learning about them i really had a good time i enjoyed um you know learning that we could maintain muscle mass by just using these i use no gravity assist if i was to do squats i would do them upside down in the air like i'd lay on my back and i'd hold the band and i'd squish them just like you'd have to do in space but when you're in this austere environment we have to be able to maintain muscle mass as we go transit to Mars. What happens to everybody on the International Space Station who comes down after 200 days? They got no muscle. Mm -hmm. They got none. And they're going to be carried off of the capsule. Who's going to carry us when we get to Mars? <laughs> Boy, we better start figuring some crap out. Like there's yeah. some real science that needs to be done and nobody's thinking about it, right? Right. What, how, how does the uh, under being underwater like uh, reduce the muscle mass? Like, is there anything because in the space disuse. there's like less gravity and but what what use you just, just totally the, the, don't the, use it. So right. if you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah, yeah, but but in as I understand, then in space it's like exacerbated the muscle loss because of the right gravity. because why things that are thousands of pounds are zero pounds because you're in zero mm. gravity. There is no gravity because you're constantly falling, right? So you have zero G. So basically you can pick things up. You can walk around. Like you could pick up thousands of pound boxes. There's no weight in it whatsoever, <laughs> right? So you, you, we don't bring lead weights to Mars because they weigh nothing, right? Mm. Oh, it's 10 million pounds. Doesn't matter, you know? So it's just a waste. But what we do is we train with resistance, pet, uh, resistance bands up there. We use something called an ARAD in space, a resistance device, an ARAD. Uh, mm. So that device is great, except we need to couple it with the blood, blood flow restriction. The blood flow restriction, as you probably well know, because you're a student of it, you increase nitric oxide synthase. NOS vasodilates. When you vasodilate, you're able to get rid of that lactic acid buildup. So it increases brain-derived neurotropic factor. There's a whole bunch of good stuff that comes with using those. So I flew them right after I got out of the water. I went and flew them in zero G. And if all goes well, I'll fly them in space. So we'll see how it goes. But that's that's absolutely my intention. <laughs> What's the like mechanism if uh, there is like some increase in metabolic rate? How does the hyperbaric environment like create that? How does it increase your metabolism? Great question. So what happens is when you increase the pressure, let's say you just double the pressure. That means you double the number of molecules that are in there. So you're exposing yourself to twice as many oxygen molecules as you would normally be. So effectively, instead of breathing 21% oxygen, effectively, you're breathing 42% oxygen. 
So you're doubling the number of oxygen molecules, which is doubling your metabolism because you've got more oxygen available. Your body goes, okay, I'm going to use that. Mm. Well, that's interesting, yeah. And in in space, would you predict that there's going to be a similar like increase in metabolic rate or... So, so many good things came out of this study that we are now opining that maybe we send a hyperbaric chamber up there and when we're transiting, we're in a hyperbaric chamber while we're in space, transiting to Mars. Hmm. And we're using that to not only live when we get to Mars, partially live when we get to Mars, but... We're using it to increase the number of stem cells, to increase, uh, to decrease the amount of inflammation, to protect us from ionizing radiation. Like this mm. is a, nobody's ever thought about this concept, but like when we finished this study, we were like, I wonder if we could get a hyperbaric chamber up there that we got, we got to have a small thing that we're going to Mars with anyway. Why can't it be a hyperbaric chamber mm -hmm. that could protect us more from the radiation of the sun? Okay. That's good. What else can it do? Yeah, maybe it can increase the number of stem cells. You know, yeah, lots of good things can come out of us transporting in a hyperbaric condition. May even set us up to when we get to Mars, we're that much better off. Mm. Yeah, like because I, as I understand, then like space ages you quite fast. So being in space makes you age quite fast, and you're experiencing a lot of this inflammation. And and yeah, like you know, why wouldn't you want to use any like whatever, like supplements or peptides or whatever, other like hormones Absolutely. to counteract that. Absolutely. To contradict. Exactly. It, you, you get aged because of all the free radicals. And like right now on the surface of the earth, we're in an electromagnetosphere, right? Like we're protected pretty much from the sun. You go out of that. Well, okay. Now all bets are off, right? And there's a coronal mass ejection, a CME that comes from the sun and like lights up our northern lights and we get this pretty show what happens to astronauts that are outside well they die mm. right <laughs> so we got to start thinking holy mackerel how are we going to protect them and it's not just trying to forecast like okay we're going to the moon oh what are we talking about 70 hour 70 hour drive to the moon 67 hour drive to the moon no big deal right like we can predict solar flares or coronal mass ejections we can predict that pretty much a couple of days ahead of time, right? But you can't predict 200 days in the future how many coronal mass ejections they're going to be and where they're going to be. So where you are in that transit from here to there, or you get hit by a CME and you're not protected by a magnetosphere and you have no prophylactic around you, whew, mm. yeah, baby. <laughs> so either we got to get an electromagnetosphere or something, you know, electromagnetic environment to shield or something. We got to do something and somebody's got to start thinking. This is why I keep going. We need the kids involved. We need the kids because the kids are thinking outside the box. The old people are down here on earth and we're just like, yeah, we're just trying to get along. We need the young people to start thinking differently and start thinking about these scientific problems that we have. Mm, right. So. Uh so the kind of concept relies on uh, this hyperbaric oxygen uh, therapy. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of my followers have heard about it, but uh, can you yeah, like explain it a bit uh, in detail as well of, you know, what it actually is and how do you like regularly do it other than like being under underwater? Right. So hyperbaric therapy has been around for 400 years. It's not a new science. It's been around for 400 years. We've known that it works on things, but you know, science wins over bullshit every time. So what we haven't done is been able to figure out the why behind it. Well, now we're starting to get where the science is catching up. In 2019, they uh, this this two guys uh, won the Nobel Prize in medicine for the discovery of something called HIF one alpha. Mm. So uh, up, up regulating uh, sort of a, uh, a gene expression thing. W what what that does is when you are in a relative hyperoxic state, more oxygen, your body gets used to it for a minute. And then when you take it away, you get relative hypoxia. When you get relative hypoxia, you induce brain derived neurotropic factor. Brain derived neurotropic factor is the lawn seed for the brain. Well, that's great. 
So if I can give you a hyperbaric treatment and then take it away from you, cycle you, which is what we would have to do on the way to Mars, we cycle the person, we give them brain-derived neurotropic factor, insulin-like growth factor, you know, we reduce their interleukin-6, the inflammatory markers, you know, we keep doing all of these things that they need done. If we cycle this, look, the only constant in life is change, right? Michael Jackson sleeping in a hyperbaric chamber never actually happened, by the way, but that's not the kind of thing that's going to be beneficial to you. If you want benefit from something on again, off again, on again, off again, on again, off again, whatever that thing is, like you can't live in the gym and work out like I work out all the time. You can't work out all the time. You need to recover as well, right? So Mm -hmm. you need to be on, off, on, off. And that's how hyperbaric medicine works, right? Is by the on again, off again. And then you turn on all these growth factors and platelet derived growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factor. And these are all known to science now, right? So now that we know all these mechanisms of actions, we can modulate, figure out what we got to get and get more of that stuff, right? Whatever that stuff is that we're looking for. Oh, you want more blood vessels. We need more vascular endothelial growth factor. Hold on. We know how to do that. Let's upregulate this, turn this button, da, 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 and boom, you get more VEGF. Mm. So that's the kind of thing. Like We need really smart people to start looking at this problem and start to develop a plan at least. You know. Mm. Yeah. So this HIF1 is hypoxia inducible factor one, and it like, upregulates when your body's experiencing uh, low oxygen levels or or a hi- uh, aspect of like hypoxia and then the body reacts to that hypoxia by increasing the these uh these uh angiogenesis uh well like by the, increasing yeah VEGF1. Uh, neuroplasticity or brain derived right. neurotrophic factor neuro uh so neurogenesis not necessarily angiogenesis but neurogenesis but yeah you're exactly right right so And it's just relative hypoxia. So if I give you a lot of oxygen and then I take it away and give you air like you're breathing right now, oh, now you have this stimulation of this HIF-1 alpha. Oh, that's great. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, so so it's a a relative aspect. If you go like, if you swim, I guess, underwater, or sorry, like if you go underwater to swim, then you're getting experiencing this shift as well because you're coming from like a, like a, you know, land, land environment. Yeah, so you may get some of that if you're breathing oxygen Hmm. underwater, yeah. Okay. And then you come back to the surface. But there are hyperbaric chambers all over the world. Like like people are... There's a hyperbaric center right here. There's, you know, right up the block. There's, there's two down the road. Uh, you know, they're, they're all over the place and you can get these kind of sort of results with that because they're known, they're peer reviewed They're It's not like, oh, well, we don't know that to be science. That's correct. No, 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 no. We know the mechanism of action of hyperbaric medicine. We have known it. There are about 11 or 12 of them that we know. One of them's toxin inhibition. One of them is growth factors, the VEGF, the uh, you know BDNF, the platelet-derived growth factor. We know that kind of stuff. You know, that is, so we know the mechanism of action. You just got to apply it correctly across a broad spectrum of whatever your problem is. You know, I think I think the at least the FDA has approved the hyperbaric oxygen therapy for like something like fifteen conditions, so different like skin burns and. Uh, carbon monoxide yeah. poisoning and those things what, yeah. what are the like so i guess these are the most like proven conditions to have uh benefited from hyperbaric uh, treatment so uh what are the not necessarily the most proven they're the ones that insurance will pay for right, right. because we think that the burden of proof i'm a scientist right the burden of proof is a randomized placebo you know double yeah. blind placebo controlled randomized trial right That is not the case. Not every single indication that is approved has gone through randomized controlled trials. Gaseous gangrene, hyperbaric oxygen works due to the mechanism of action called toxin inhibition, right? When you get over 450 millimeters of mercury delivered to your finger, you probably get about 50 right now. When you get over 450 millimeters of mercury to your cellular level, You cannot produce toxins at the cellular level. So it stops gaseous gangrene in its tracks. But there are no randomized controlled trials on that. Why? Well, Mm. that lacks efficacy. That's just like skeezy, right? 
oh, we're going to we're going to give you the good stuff that we know does this, but we're not going to give you it. Uh, no, it, it lacks, uh, you know, it, it lacks the sniff test, if you know what I mean. Right. So you're saying that there are uh, like these plausible, like uh, proven mechanisms by which uh, that it can help various conditions, but the FDA has approved only like a handful of... Uh, yeah, they approved 15 approved right. indications. And what does that mean? 15 approved indications means that insurance will most likely cover them. Well, mm. I, don't, I don't give a crap about insurance. I don't care at all about insurance. I care about helping the person. So I look at the mechanism, just like every other physician, right? And I teach physicians at the University of South Florida. I train them to look at the mechanism of action and find the disease. Let's just take a silly one, Crohn's, right? It's a disease of inflammation. We already know one of the mechanism of action, hyperbaric medicine, is it reduces the inflammatory process, reduces the cytokine storm. So if this disease comes from an inflammatory process, do you think that we could apply the anti-inflammatory and it might work? Mm. Is it, this is simple. Like, should it work? Yeah, probably. Are there double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials? Nope. Because nobody's paying for them. Right, but that right. doesn't mean that it doesn't work. Like, like, Science wins over bullshit, but God, what works works, right? You know, so so we try this, and this is what we're trying to do: is bring things that are off label to the on label column. And you know, I guess it's to get them paid or to get people paid, but really, it's to truly help people. And if you're looking to help people, then don't worry about the money. Don't worry about getting paid back for it. Just just try and do it and see what happens, right? Mm. So that's kind of what I'm trying to get the doctors to start thinking in that vein. And, you know, it's working, but it's a slow process. We are changing medicine by the day. Right. Uh, what about the telomeres and the stem cells? So these are oh, yeah. like one of the main hallmarks of aging. So telomere attrition and stem cell exhaustion. And you saw that your telomeres increased and your stem cells increased. So yeah. uh, what's the like first mechanism of that with the hyperbaric or at least like well, under C, so it kind of works through the hyperbaric mechanism, but are there any yeah, like it uh, is studies? It's the exact where... same thing. The increased pressure is the increased pressure is the increased right. However you get it, you can submerge yourself in a vat of, you know, hydrogen, doesn't matter. Increase the pressure, doesn't matter. Hmm. So, well, don't do the hydrogen because it's explosive. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, 100%, the, the mechanism of action is called reverse transcriptase right? So what you're doing is you're building on the end of the telomeres, right? Uh, on the end of the chromosomes, you have these little things called telomeres. And as you use them, you lose them. They go away, they go away, they go away, they go away. When they're gone, the ends fray, and then you can't really replicate that anymore. And you can't transcript that. So that's cellular senescence, cell death, right? That's it. So realistically, if I can increase that by 17%, or in some papers, uh, Efrati, Shea Efrati, a great researcher, he found uh, that he increased it by 33%, 30 to 33% depends on which paper you read. Um, but you know, if you're, if you're doing that, that means you're multiplying your life of your cell by one third, you know, I mean, come on, that, that, that's pretty damn substantial, right? So is that the cure to aging? No. Could you get hit by a bus tomorrow? Yeah. It's not going to prevent that. Mm -hmm. But is it going right. to make that cell be able to be replicated more? Oh, that's that's science, man. That works, right? Mm. So yes, that's the absolute truth. But you know, yeah, so, it's like extending like healthy aging and uh, prolonging the healthy functioning of the cell, kind of uh, longer. Hundred percent. And then if you believe some of the other stuff that's written, and you combine it with some science, and you go, well, hold on a second, wait a minute. If I can extend the length of this cell and then I can turn on a sirtuin activating compound or a sac, click, and I can stop this thing from replicating and start it to be in survival mode, I could even extend it further, right? So we can use science to go ahead and extend the things that we're already trying to extend. Look, this is, this is my personal love. This is not my, my job. My job as the assistant vice president of veterans clinical research at the University of South Florida has nothing to do with me extending my personal longevity. That's what I'm doing is extending my personal longevity. I'm 
hitting the gym. I spell gym with a G, not with a J, right? Uh, because I want to do the things that I want to do long term. I want to induce hormesis, which takes those sacs, turns them on, and puts them in the the uh, chill out mode. Stop replicating and start to kind of uh, protect yourself mode. So mm. the ice bath. I do I do lots of stuff like that. Yeah, is it proven? Double blind, randomized? Nope. Nope. Right. Yeah, I think Does the science fit. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I think there was this uh, actually in humans in 2000. I remember from 2020, there was a Israel study, I think, where they did use the hyperbaric as well. And they saw like the telomeres increased by 20% in uh, humans. So it's obviously like a like a single study as of now, but uh, yeah, like uh, at, at least it's shown to like work in other people as well, <laughs> not just. Uh, is is that Shea Frady's uh Shea Frady's study? Uh, He's from Israel. I'm looking at the authors of this. Yeah, Shea Frady. Yeah, is one of the authors. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's that's probably him. Yeah. No, great study. Great study. He's one of the best researchers I've ever seen in our new research pool of people right he's he's mm -hmm. great at what he does so and he pushes the boundaries right mm. yeah another 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 thing that he found was that the uh, immunosenescence uh, decreased as well so the aging of the uh, immune uh, immune system which uh, is also like a pretty problematic thing uh, that we they all the people gen generally oh, see yeah. a decrease in their immune function and, uh, you know, cell senescence is also like a hallmark of aging and immunosenescence is like a subcategory of this uh, right. cell senescence right, right. phenomenon. Now the zombie cells. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, the, all these hallmarks of aging, if we can just start clipping it, right, and trimming it back and making it better, you give yourself the better opportunity to survive, right? Which is all we're really doing. Like people say, oh, it's the, it's the holy grail. We're going to, you know, we're going to cure aging. <laughs> Hold on a second. <laughs> Science, right? We we can give your body the tools to help itself, right? So hyperbaric oxygen doesn't cure anything, right? So if you right. have leukemia, leukemia means you don't produce these uh, these red blood cells very well. You don't transport the oxygen very well. I can give you oxygen that you can then deliver to yourself. No problem. Does it cure leukemia? Nope. Right. So it gives your body the tools to help itself. And if everything is great, then things are great. Right. That's all we're doing. We're giving, you know, luck favors the prepared. Am I going to live to 110? That's my plan. I'm going to prepare my body to live to 110 and do the best, my body and my brain, because you cannot, I, I'm not living to 110 in a vegetative state. Right. There's no, I don't want Alzheimer's. I don't want any, you know, I don't want any dementia. I, I intend to circumvent that through the use of the things that I'm doing, you know? Mm, right. And uh, I think it does apply to like other senescent cells as well, not just uh, immune cells. So I think there was like another study about skin aging as well, because the the accumulation of the senescent cells is one of the biggest uh, causes of intrinsic uh, skin aging. So like wrinkles and uh, loss of collagen and those things as well are primarily driven by the cell uh, senescence. Yeah, no, that's 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 very true, the elasticity and yeah, it, that is certainly the case, but you know, so like back up to one of the other known mechanism of action, you know, collagen synthesis. Mm. <laughs> Fiber bass proliferation secondary to coll collagen synthesis. Wait, you can give you more of that collagen stuff for your building of all your uh, Oh, okay. So you can look younger? You can look younger. You know, and he, he did another study called like uh, cognitive enhancement in a declining age population, I think was the actual name of the study, but perfect, right? Like, wait, you mean I can get an increase on my ability to multitask and remember things? Uh, uh, you, you have my attention now, right? Like I can get smarter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take two. Right. And what about the stem cells? Like how, what's the like mechanism there that it, uh, increases? Yeah. So stem cells is just one of those things. Uh, it's, it's, we're really tricking our body into the point where it's at, um, at the point of needing stem cells. So basically it's just a trick on your body. Steve Thom did this work in 
I want to say it was the 70s or 80s, long time ago we did this work. And what he found is that in hyperbaric medicine, you multiply the number of stem cells by eight if you do 20 treatments at this pressure and this depth, blah, blah, blah. So we were like, oh, hey, I wonder what? I wonder how this works. Then one of these new PhD researchers just did, the young guy just got his PhD. Uh, he just found out that if you pressurize somebody in air, five times to 1.3, remember I was at 1.7, five times in air, you double the number of CD34 plus progenitor stem cells. So we mm. believe, the believe, believe the mechanism of action at this point is more so having to do with the pressure and less so having to do with the oxygen. Mm. Really freaking cool. So that means that you can go on a scuba dive every day and you can double the number of stem cells that you have by tricking your body. So stem cells can be used for anything, especially the, you know, CD34 plus, you know, they're like the wild card of all stem cells, if you will. Wow. And, and, you know, it's proliferation. I mean, you're, you're basically, you're letting these things loose to help heal. Now, does that shorten your life? I don't, you know, there's more things, there's more questions to ask, right? Right. If you have a healthy immune system and everything's going well and your bone marrow is great and you're okay, then maybe you, maybe you are okay. Who knows? Mm. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah. Like, so you can just do scuba diving or some other like, uh, high pressure. Just an increase in pressure. Right. Right. Mm. So I think like, maybe like, I don't know if there's any data about that, like, but our scuba divers with longer life expectancy or something, I'm just guessing. So there's a there's a bit of research that being that's being done right now in PTSD, amelioration of PTSD by scuba diving. So there's mm. a whole bunch of research going on right now with that. And what is that? Hyperbaric. It's just more pressure. That's it. It's hyperbaric, it's hyperbaric medicine. Scuba diving, hyperbaric medicine. Pressurizing in a hyperbaric chamber, hyperbaric medicine. Living underwater for 100 days, hyperbaric medicine. Going in space, hyperbaric medicine. Same stuff. Right. Uh, what about like the downsides? So like, you know, there's rarely things that are just 100% beneficial, yeah. at least when it comes to HF1s and hypoxia and uh, angiogenesis, as well as like even the telomerase activation. So yeah. They're they're all implicated in some aspects of cancer as well. So like the cancer can survive in this uh, low oxygen environment by increasing the blood supply to itself, and uh, with the telomerase, it can also like uh, I've heard like that it can like immortalize cancer cells as well. So this uh, replication of the telomer telomeres on the cancer cells. So uh, what, yeah, what like what do you think about the are there any like real negatives and downsides to like maybe doing yeah. too much or uh, in some people. That's why I say you need to not be doing this full time. The only constant in life is change. You need to fluctuate, moderate, right? Right. So while I was down there, look, when astronauts are in space, they grow. Why? Zero gravity. Nothing's compressing them. They're being flung around. They're actually in tension. They're being pulled apart. Mm. Me, I was underwater. I was being compressed. So I was in compression. I shrunk by three quarters of an inch. <laughs> well. ah, okay it's science whatever i shrunk everybody said no you didn't shrink i'm like i shrunk i'm telling you i'm not hitting my head on the thing anymore sure enough i came out and i lost three quarters of an inch. okay no big deal wow. but uh a lot of things like that happened a lot of things came up like that um and yes there are some possibilities of you staying in that environment long periods of time that there could be problems. Uh, however, comma, what you try and do is you try and ameliorate these things. So the hypoxia that you're talking about, that's absolutely true. And uh, cancer will create angiogenesis. It'll create vascular endothelial growth factor if it's not getting a proper blood supply. But when you're in hyperbaric medicine, you're giving it the oxygen that it needs not to grow, not to take over the other cell next door, right? Cancer is one of these things like, hey, knocks on the cell next door, says, hey, do you have any oxygen? Cell goes, yeah, I got some. Would you like one? And he goes, no, 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 I'll just take it all. I'll just take you over, right? That's <laughs> the way cancer metastasizes, right? It's like gobbling and scavenging, right? It doesn't do that when it's in hyperbaric oxygen because it's getting fed the oxygen that it needs, right? 
So it's not necessarily growing now um, with respect to you coming off and being in hypoxia. You're just in relative hypoxia, remember? And that relative state is a short period of time because your body then realizes, oh, shit, this is where I was supposed to be. I'm at 21%, which is my norm. Oh, okay, I'll just go back to being my normal, right? So it's just that that quick change. So not not there long enough to induce cancer, at least so we see so far. Nobody knows. Like, great questions because nobody's doing research on that kind of stuff. So yeah, that uh, that senescence, the zombie cell, there, you, the the propagation of telomeres. Yeah, you're absolutely right. If you get to a point where you got the wrong, you know, uh, chromosome, and you have made that chromosome longer, then yeah, you'll be doing bad things for cancer. Mm. Hasn't happened, but it could right. happen. Yes, it's theoretic, right? Yeah, it like comes that comes down to this constant uh, exposure to this uh, stress, or so like you know. The same can apply to some other like these uh, pathways that work through the same like hormetic pathways. So like you know whatever like other similar stressor can also have like a similar effect, like an unwanted consequence in some sense. But yeah, like, yeah, unintended consequence. Absolutely. Yeah, it can just yeah, or you know, it comes down to yeah, probably like just managing the dose and uh, the frequency of not giving the same type of stressor all the time. You know, the same way like you're you don't want to yeah like work out all the time. You need some time to kind of take a break as well. Exactly. Right. And, and, you know, every once in a while, go in the ice bath, induce that hormesis. And then every once in a while, stress your brain, give that hormesis. And then every once in a while, stress your muscles, give that, you know, mm. it's a variation of life, right? The only constant is change. Yeah. So, so what, what would be like, uh, I heard that your vision is that people go to these underwater uh, hotels for, two weeks and uh, get this hyperbaric medicine uh, by being underwater. But, uh, you know, first of all, are there any like companies doing that now? Or, uh, and the second question is, yeah, like, how do they do it? Okay. If they want to find a hyperbaric clinic, like what are some, like, uh, I guess, I guess like some uh, pointers for them. Yeah. You can look in the phone book and find any hyperbaric clinic, make sure they're trained by somebody like the international board of undersea medicine or equivalent. Right. I mean, we got, we, we have standards, we have to make sure you don't want to, last thing you want to do is get in trouble in a hyperbaric chamber. because Bad things can happen. Right. Like the, it can blow up. Right. We've mm. seen these things blow wow. up from time to time, but you go to a reputable place like the ones that have an eye bum seal of approval. And then, yeah, absolutely. Could be, uh, could be, could be easily done. That would be my push is to search for somebody that is IBUM approved and then, you know, go from there. But uh, realistically, you look in the yellow pages. I, I guess they still have yellow pages, but just Google it and look up at medicine center and then call them and ask them what they do. You know, the soft chambers do what they do. The hard chambers do what they do. There are two different mechanisms of actions, um, you know. So I would tend to lean towards the soft, uh, the hard chambers. I mean, I tend to lean towards the hard chambers for the mechanisms that I want to happen. But that doesn't mean that physics stops working, right? Physics works, but the same thing as going for a dive, right? If you just go for a very shallow dive, you can get some of these health benefits. You get them quicker when you go deeper and stay longer. So if you don't have that kind of time, go to the hard ones. Uh, but short of that, um, and you always, always, always want to walk in that facility and feel safe and comfortable. Because remember, you're dealing with oxygen. And oxygen, while it's not flammable, oxygen is not flammable at all. Mm. It is an accelerant. It will make things burn faster. Mm. Do not mess with that. It's not something to be trifled with. So you want to make sure they have a red book, which has all of their emergency procedures and that they've been well-trained and taking care, you know, so, you know, give it your first due diligence. You know, you don't go to the witch doctor that has the, uh, the shrunken head hanging in the front. And, oh, Hey, let me go to that doctor. You know, maybe you go to, you know, so. Right. <laughs> yeah. Do the, like the soft chambers also explode or. Soft chambers can, they have not yet, but mm. that doesn't mean that they can't. Right. Uh, they're, they are newer. They've been around for about 25 or so years, I'm guessing. 
uh, and they haven't had nearly the safety record because they're not as dynamic and they're not as full of pressure and they're not usually filled with 100% oxygen. So if that's the case, then they're less volatile. I mean, that's just physics, right? You can, you can state that empirically because it's physics, right? And people get worried about them all the time, but they have a great safety record. But mm. they don't do it as quickly as, you know, but it depends on what ailed you, right? It depends on what the issue is that you're trying to fix. Mm. How often, so like one session, I guess, I've done it like a few times. Um, how I don't remember exactly how long the session was, like maybe like 45 minutes or 60 minutes, something like that, right? One hour usually. Mm. They're usually one hour, so a total of 76 minutes which basically a 76 minute treatment, it's 10 minutes to descend, one hour of time at depth, six minutes to ascend, and then some time to change your clothes. So plan on an hour and a half. Uh, and here's the way that we have seen. We have seen best results if you do them consistently over short bursts of time. So basically do 10 treatments over the course of two weeks, one a day, every day, Monday through Friday, and go away on the weekends, then come back on Monday through Friday, and that will give you the best benefit. Now, I'm not a I'm not a used car salesman. I don't make any money off of this. I'm just trying to tell people, like, listen, your best bet is to do it frequently and then stop doing it, right? Because remember, you want to oscillate, right? You want to always change. So you don't ever want to just keep doing hyperbarics your entire life. If any practitioner says, just keep coming back and, and I'll just treat you every day your entire life, run, run, because they're not understanding the mechanisms of action, right? So we need to, we need to modulate, we need to change, we need to change it up. Otherwise, your body's going to get used to it. And then, you know, maybe even bad things are going to happen like you had mentioned, right? So, you know, what we do is we change stuff. So, Right. Gotcha. And uh, what if uh, someone is, doesn't have any health issues? Uh, is it still, would, would you like think they have anything to gain in terms of like either preventing so or increasing the body's resilience or what, what would any like person who doesn't have any health issues, uh, you know, is it something that they can actually gain additional benefits from or, or does it only work if you have any, any in particular like a inflammatory condition? Yeah, so science always wins, right? Now, let me to answer that question, let me go to off track betting, off track betting and horse racing. You're like, why are we talking about horse racing? We're talking about horse racing because horse racing forbids you to be your horse to be in a hyperbaric chamber within 24 hours of a race. Oh, really? Because <laughs> they consider it a performance enhancing drug. Wow. Hey, what? <laughs> <laughs> if the betting people are like, wait, 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 you can't do that. That's a, that's a boost. You can't do that. <laughs> Pretty loudly says, but nobody's doing wellness studies, right? So from a scientific standpoint, as a scientist, I can't say that it does. Does it make you feel better? Yeah. But feeling better is not objective quality evidence. Mm. I'm a scientist. Yeah. Science wins over bullshit. And when you say I feel better, that's bullshit. I, I feel <laughs> yeah. better. I look better. I look better too. My hair's long. I have no idea. Right. But you can't just say stuff. Right. Yeah. So do we think, yeah, we think it's a performance enhancing drug, but it's not yet classified as one. It is for the horses. It is for some other things, but it's what about not the Olympics? Is it uh, banned in the Olympics? Or <laughs> yeah. Right. It's just, Hey, just start treating people in hyperbaric chambers in between races. Hey, it's just the way it is, right? But uh, yeah, now I, uh, I I suspect that at some point somebody's going to get onto it, and some sports team is going to have a hyperbaric chamber, and then before you know it, their guys are going to be running faster, harder, you know, able to produce more, able to generate more energy, whatever, 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 and they're going to win, and somebody's going to claim foul, and it's going to. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh... So, do I think it helps you for wellness? Yes. Could it also hurt you? Yeah. If you sleep in a hyperbaric chamber, yeah, it could really hurt you. Don't do that. Right. Like oscillate it, right. Change it up, you know, find, find a good doctor that knows what he's doing or she's doing and, and work through it. You know? mm. Yeah. Interesting. Like I, I, I did it, you know, I guess I did it like two or three times in the past. I didn't notice like anything uh, significant when I did it. Um, 
but I did it only like, you know, I did it once. And then the next time I did it again, like in a year, just that I could try it out. But maybe at least I didn't notice like any uh, difference. I didn't like notice any like, you know, difference in my like w feeling or uh, sleep or did you do it consistently for like no, 10 days. Yeah, no, that's I did. Like I did only like one session, like yeah. one session. So I, I was visiting uh, like uh, another city like London or LA or something. And then I did it there so at some local clinic. And, uh, you know, the next time I did it was again, like in another year <laughs> when I was visiting another city. So I, I, yeah, I haven't done it like consistently, but, uh, even like from, so like, I guess one session might not be enough or, or is it no, think... one session is not enough for anything except science, right? Except we have seen that migraines get better in mm. one session. That's the only thing that gets better in one session that we've seen so far. Mm. Gotcha. So, right. but yeah, you need generally speaking about 10 to start to get the anti-inflammatory effect, maybe 20 to start doing angiogenesis depends on what the mechanism of action that you want is right. So we got to, this is why everybody's like, just go to 2.0 for 60 minutes. And I'm like, why? You don't even know what you're talking about. Really? <laughs> like every case is different. Every person's different. I try and get the MDs. I'm like, you better start asking freaking questions. Because if you just walk in there and give them exactly the same thing, like, oh yeah, here's a here's a cookie. You want a cookie? Here's a cookie, here's a cookie. And you keep giving out the same cookie, you're only gonna get what they give you, you know? So you gotta modulate it, you gotta figure it out. You ought to be prescribing, you know. Yeah. You ought to mm -hmm. be prescribing it and checking it. Right. What if the people who have their own soft chamber at home, like uh like I, I haven't used one at home, so I don't know that like the settings, are there any like, if you do have it at home, like what settings you should like look at, like the yeah. pressure or- Don't the... do it too often. Don't right. do it too often. Be very careful in what you're doing and, uh, uh, you know, um, be doing it for the right reason. Take a training course because if you're doing it at home, you could still get hurt. The shallowest recorded depth of an arterial gas embolism is three feet. So that's a meter for crying out loud. I mean, you were talking nothing, right? Like mm. the difference in pressure, you know, you're taking those chambers, the soft chambers, even the ones you use at home to about uh, 11 feet. Mm. So the shallowest recorded depth is three feet. That means at four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, you can still get an arterial gas. Um, so you could hurt yourself. So we definitely want to make sure you get training. So seek like the International Board of Undersea Medicine, seek them out and just get some training so that you know what you're doing and you don't accidentally hurt yourself, right? Mm. Um, and and this way you don't, God forbid, I mean, you do something to your house, you know? Like, right. oh, I got a good idea. Let me just take my laptop in this oxygen-filled chamber. No, don't do that, <laughs> right? Like, well, wait a minute, I didn't even think. Well, that's all right, they'll teach you in the course, right? They'll right. teach you to be as safe as possible. So. Right. Well, yeah, that's good because, you know, that's what I, I would have thought to do, like with a the, with the laptop or like a phone or whatever. Oh, right. So I can work more. No, okay. your job is to get in there, breathe in and out, box breathe, meditative breathe, repeat as necessary, think, do something without your without your phone, right? Without this damn device that you have, like, and just think. And just breathe and just be. Give yourself that one hour a day. One hour. Just <laughs> give it to yourself. And you will be like, damn, I feel so much better. So we don't know whether it's the intrinsic benefit of breathing and just relaxing without the phone for an hour or whether it's really the hyperbaric oxygen. Whichever <laughs> one, it works. Who cares, right? Yeah. Uh, what What is like next for you in terms of this uh deep sea saga <laughs> so are you planning on any other uh, new trip longer trip the 200 day trip i'm not planning a 200 day trip but i am absolutely planning on looking at space so mm -hmm. elon i know i keep saying bad things about you but if, if you're a listener of the podcast here by all means man pick me coach i'm in there yeah i that applied to good. nasa this year so we'll see i'd love to uh love to make that happen i just got my uh patent my u.s patent on the life support system device and the early warning detection system so i, I think i'm primed for it so we'll see 
you know, we'll see what happens, but uh, hopefully I have a lot that I can still keep giving, man. And, you know, Mm. yeah that sounds cool yeah that sounds pretty awesome and i'm yeah like you know excited to see how you know people in space kind of use some of this kind of technology and uh you know other things as well like to counteract the inflammation and the oxidative stress and you know you kind of have to stack all the things that we kind of (laughs) know right put all the balls in your court right like listen i'm gonna take that it's coming with me i'm gonna take that it's coming with me this 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 i'm gonna pile up as much stuff because listen the space will happily and gleefully kill you. It's, mm. It won't even think about it. It's just like, yeah. oh, oh, well, my bad. You know, something mm. going this way at a thousand miles an hour and something going this way at a thousand miles an hour, nothing's going to survive it, right? So you just got to think there's lots of stuff floating around our universe. So I don't yeah. know. You know, it's an inherently dangerous environment. So we need to figure out to give ourselves the, the stack of stuff to do the best that we could. Mm. is there any way to for people to like support your project or where can they learn more about maybe if they want to do this experiment themselves great uh, yeah and listen anybody that wants to stay underwater for a prolonged period of time i will help you contact me dr deep c instagram is dr deep c jodatory google me whatever whatever go to www.drdeepc.com and and contact me and i literally i answer all of those right so mm. th- you know i'll i'll get back to you if you want help staying underwater you want help with a place to i want to learn how to dive in new york city i'll be like oh big apple divers hold on i got these guys over there they're good people you know i'm not gonna pay for it but you know <laughs> i'll help you you know what i'm saying i'll right. point you in the right direction if you're young and you're into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, I'll help you. I'll work with you. I'll write letters of recommendation for you from the assistant vice president of the University of South Florida. I will do everything that I can to help your career and to help you break my record. Let's do that. (laughs) This way, the world wins. It's not me. It's not my record. Who cares? It wasn't even about the record. It was just to get kids to start to think about the world differently and that look you got to hand this ball off to somebody you know yeah 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 that's a uh, really important i agree um but yeah i, I think I, you mentioned some of the socials and the website i'll put the links in the show notes for Please. people to check out and uh my last question is uh what's this one piece of advice or habit that you wish you adopted sooner <laughs> Just learned this. I literally just learned this. Um, so truth be told, I got a 910 on my SAT. So I believed it when the guidance counselor said, oh, you're not going to amount to anything. I believed other people for the longest time. And then I went to the Navy. And then I learned how to learn. And then I went to night school. And I was like, oh, wow, this isn't that bad. Okay, I can figure that out. And then I was like, oh, maybe, maybe you are actually 3545 five GPA in college. Not bad. All right. Maybe you can go get a master's. Boom, master's. Uh, maybe you can go get a PhD. Stop listening to other people. Stop. Don't, they, 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 they're not in your body. They're not in your world. They're not in your life. Don't listen to anybody. Just keep going. <laughs> and mm-hmm. and now that I've got that, I'm like, oh, here, hold my beer. Go watch this. <laughs> yeah. Like you can't, you can't stay in the water. That's gonna hurt you. Blah, blah, blah. You can't do this. That's gonna, I'm like, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, man. Take the attitude of hold my beer. Anytime <laughs> somebody says you can't, <laughs> watch. Yeah. Well, that's a good, a good advice. Yeah, and I support that so for sure. Well, it's been a great talking with you and yeah, looking forward to, I guess, the space trip and you. maybe the next next record in the underwater. <laughs> yeah, great. Listen, do me a favor, tag me on this and let's let's like do this mutual post test thing. Sure. We can get this out to a great group of audience. This is a great interview. I went places where I hadn't gone before, so mm. I love it. I love this kind of stuff. Thank you for a great interview. Well, my pleasure. It's a great talk with you as well. <laughs> All right. Cheers.